distinct way, both men were charged with printing pamphlets. However, they didn't even print them. Their grandmother, Bilqis, tells the story. Both men were arrested and had their handwriting analyzed, but it didn't match what was on the pamphlet. They were found to be innocent by the court. Their uncle, James Om Pakash, explains what happened next. जेल तक ना मॉल भी खिला रहे ऐसी भी ताके ये इतनो दालत तो छोटी जाने के चल जाने के ना तो जेल तक इन्होंने मार देना है। It's not always enough to frame your targets in the commission of a crime they didn't commit. Often public sentiment must accompany the outrage and hatred of one person. This requires carrying the lie to the masses who often gather in places of worship at times and places where they are most sensitive about matters of faith. If while praying they uh, overhear that a blasphemy law has been broken, they are more inclined to act on such outrage. Therefore, it's not enough to accuse someone of violating a blasphemy law after actually committing the crime yourself. The next step requires an angry mob. Such was the case of Imran Masih, a Christian who was framed for blasphemy crime he didn't even commit. Mr. Ghafoor Masih Jill explains what happens to his son. <laughs> Imagine being arrested completely unexpectedly. When you demand to know why you've been arrested, you're told you showed disrespect to someone by burning a book. Knowing you had done no such thing, you demand a lawyer. One is not provided and you are thrown in jail after being brought up on charges. That may sound crazy to you, but it's reality for Christians in Pakistan. Imran's father had to endure seeing his son sentenced to several years in prison after his arrest in 2009. Perhaps one of the most publicized cases of Christian persecution involved that of Asiya Bibi, a Christian woman and mother of four children who was sentenced to death for committing blasphemy. She was accused of making derogatory remarks against Islam's prophet Muhammad. Coming to Bibi's aid was the governor of the central Punjab province, Salman Taysir. He very publicly supported Aslia and actively fought to have blasphemy laws repealed. Unfortunately, this stance ultimately led to his death. Tragically, Tessir was murdered not by someone who got by his bodyguards, but at the hands of one of them. Tessir decided that it is better to die with honor than to live in fear. In possibly one of the more violently egregious and senseless acts of persecution, the Christian colony of Gorja City was literally set aflame after angry mobs claimed to find ripped out pages from Quranic verses. Rage over the incident served as a spark that set the colony entirely on fire. When it was all over, 110 houses were torched and seven Christians, innocent people, were burned alive. 
One of the survivors of the Gurja city attack was Mr. Salmat Shami. He explains the origin of the torn pages. Actually, there was an incident that did not happen in Gojra, that they have burned our houses. It happened in nearby village called Korea. There was a man who was selling used goods on his trolley. Somewhere he got an Islamic book of school. In evening, his children has taken that book from the house. It has been said that these children has torn up the pages of that book. In the morning, our Muslim friends has found these pages. They came up with anger and asked other Muslim to get together. Word spread that Christians were responsible. Anger grew to rage and rage to violence based on likely nothing more than the innocent actions of children who meant no harm. They gathered all the peoples of Gojra city burn this village. People left open their houses and ran away. All the people came out of this place and those who were not leaving were beaten and has been compelled to run away. Their home were broken and put them on fire. Nothing was left over there. Even they have killed our animals. Shami explained that police did little to stem the attack and in many cases supported the perpetrators no matter their motives. Security forces decided to flee the situation, leaving civilians with a painful decision they desperately did not want to make. Either flee or stay and face the consequences of a rabid mob. Take the case of Yusuf Masih. He was an animal trader and had achieved financial standing as well as success through hard work. Consequently, he soon became a victim of blasphemy laws. Yusuf's wife, Teresa, tells his story. फिर उन्होंने मतलब बसी उससे रात ही उन्होंने लान कर दिते मॉल भी आने भी उधी बेटी लाब दी उधी बीवी लाब दी है तो उसी उन्हें फाड़ के तो मतलब महज़ दे बेच ले आवो साड़ासी नाक को तो वाड़ के तो मतलब बसी उन्होंने ऐसे शहर दे बेच एक मतलब बिज़त करांगे। After hearing about this, Teresa hurriedly fled with her children in order to hide from the mob that was going to descend on them. Aren't houses of worship supposed to preach peace, love, and tolerance? How could it be that a holy place would preach lynching? Teresa tells of how her husband was tortured by police as she and their children lived on the run and in hiding. At one point, explains Teresa, it was demanded of Yusuf that he tell police where his wife and children were, thinking they had already been murdered by forces sympathetic to those who were torturing him, he told them they were already dead. Yusuf Masih was not only a good husband and father who cared for his family, he was also someone who did so by relying on his own intuition and abilities. For that and his faith, he was arrested and his family was broken apart. Finally, the story of Fanish Robert Masih is similar to that of Kamar David. Like Kamar, Fanish was imprisoned for his faith. Also like Kamar, 
Fanish was murdered while jailed. At 20 years old, Fanish was vibrant and full of life. The official cause of death, of course, was listed as suicide. Why would a young Christian man charged with blasphemy kill himself? If he was willing to renounce his Christian faith, he may have been released. If he decided not to renounce it, killing himself would have meant violating that faith after committing to it in the face of torture, terror and further imprisonment. In calling this young man's death a suicide, those who ruled in such a way only implicated themselves. There is an inscription on an ancient mantelpiece in Hindshead Hotel in Bray, England, which says, Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. No one was there. Right now, there are Christians in Pakistan dying for what they believe, while Western media fails to pay attention. The stories you've just watched are common in a number of Islamic countries. There are few nations that will stand up against it. The United Nations is silent on the persecution of Christians since so many of its members are guilty themselves. As in the days of Hitler, the press diverts the attention of the public to promote its own agenda. These persecuted Christian brothers have only us to reach out to for help. They need legal representation, protection, prayer, and a safe haven. The Raoul Wallenberg Project Rescue Christians is already on the ground in Pakistan, helping by providing funds for food, a safe haven, and efforts to relocate families to friendlier countries. But the need is great, and the funds are limited. If God has laid it upon your heart to help, please send a gift. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan who had mercy on a persecuted brother whom no one else would help. Please pray about helping our effort to extend a hand of protection to our Christian brothers in Pakistan. All monies donated will be used in assisting families undergoing legal challenges and persecution to their faith, helping to keep Christian families together and supporting the legal rights of the Christian community in Pakistan. Your donation will bring relief to many who suffer under this persecution. Your donation will be used to help move them and others to safer countries where they can worship and rebuild their lives in freedom. Please call now, 877-832-7200 with a tax-deductible gift. The Pakistani Christians who prepared and appeared in this program have done so knowing that they put their lives at risk by telling you their stories. They wanted you to know what was happening to them in Pakistan. Your donation will be used to help pay for food, clothing, a secure place to stay, and relocation to friendlier countries. Please call now, 877-832-7200 with a tax-deductible gift. Our Christian brothers and sisters in Pakistan have nowhere else to turn. You are their only hope in a land that will not protect them. You may call 877-832-7200 or go online to www.rescuechristians.org to donate and visit testimonials of families helped by Rescue Christians. Please call now. Donations are urgently needed. 877-832-7200. That's 877-832-7200. Your donation is tax deductible. That's toll free at 877-832-7200. Or go to rescuechristians.org. The Raoul Wallenberg Project, Rescue Christians, is a division of Forum for Middle East Understanding, a registered 501c3. Thank you for your support.